Welcome class. Today I have a very interesting case study. I think you're going to enjoy this. We're going to be looking at the velocity banking concept, the infinite banking concept, and debt snowball. Which one of these strategies should I do? Is it one over the other? Or is there an opportunity where we can bring all of these concepts together, right? I think what can happen when you come across a new strategy, a new concept, is we tend to throw out whatever we were doing prior because we just came across something that sounds or may be way better than whatever we were doing before. And what I've learned personally over the years is sometimes it doesn't hurt to keep some of the good habits or principles you were doing and apply them when it works. And when something's more efficient, then we bring that up to the forefront. And then when it no longer becomes efficient, then we can bring this up. So I want to give you that transparency that I've, you know, over the years, I've become a fan of combining strategies rather than velocity banking versus infinite banking or velocity banking over infinite banking, infinite banking over velocity banking, that snowball over this, extra payments over that. I've decided to start creating content that's less about trying to be right or proving that this is better than that and just simply showing you the results of each option, just giving you the math, giving the numbers, allowing you to make a decision. And the great part about it all is a decision is a decision when it comes to your finances. When you when you make that financial decision, you lay in it, right? You see it through. If it provides success on paper, numbers-wise, you're, you're ahead, or if it teaches you a lesson, I've learned that the decisions I make either are working for me or working on me. If they're working on me, maybe it's a, a, a way for me to learn and get better. If it's working for me, that's literally working for me. I'm not going to try and uh, fix something that's not broke, right? So with that being said, let's dive right into the numeros. Numeros. Four major numbers on the left-hand side. We have a individual on the board. It's a married uh, individual here, husband and wife. I'm dealing with the husband. Generates $12,767 a month. That is net take home. Our total expenses are $9,237. We have total debt of $210,076 with a cash flow of $3,530. We have $30,000 in savings we have $350,000 in a 401k. We have no life insurance, okay? There's no life insurance at the moment. I believe they have very, very small coverage like through work, but not enough for to cover their human life value. And these are the three debts that they have. They have one credit card, one car, one mortgage. These are the interest rates, 8.59%, 3.75%. The credit card was like 20 something percent, but it's literally gonna get, it's gonna be the first thing we literally pay off. And I'm going to tell you why and where we are at in this particular timeline as I'm recording this video. So it is September of 2023 as I record this video, mid-September. This person became a client towards the end of middle of August. We do not have a debt tool at the moment. So therefore, there is no velocity banking being done. So what that means is there is some pre-game work, there's some time that we're going to take to get ourselves ready for the velocity banking concept. During that period of time when I'm not doing velocity banking, what could I be doing? Making extra payments towards my debt. So that's going to be the first move that this person does is simply make extra payments via their cash flow to eliminate debt. Simple as that. They already have savings, emergency fund, They've got money from their income going into retirement. There's already a percentage going there, percentage from the expenses going into savings. That's already happening, right? In the past, now they're going to start directing a lot or all of their cash flow towards debt elimination. Some other key points here is the value of their home is uh, roughly $750,000. They only owe one fifty seven. dollars that's the total mortgage payment. Of that 2054, they're making an additional $150 extra principal payment within that 2054-59. And they've got 22 years left on the mortgage. Maturity date is 2045. So I'm giving you these things for those that want to plug this into an Excel and you can kind of run it and see what the uh, net 
principal and interest payment comes out to is right here, 989.54. This is how much is their uh, escrow in a year, roughly. That could change, obviously. Then we have this car note. We've got 77 payments left on that. So you can get the full timeline on how that works and how much principal and interest is of that $800. So I'm giving you all that detail. Now, very first move. This person has a desire to pay off debt. That is their focus right now. That's what they want to dedicate their cash flow to. The question is, how do we go about doing that? I could either go the uh, traditional route, or I should say the most popular strategy is debt snowball. We look at the smallest debt that you have, and we apply that extra cash flow towards the smallest debt. Once that's done, we take the cash flow gain from that, and we apply it towards the next smallest debt, the next smallest debt, and we go from there, right? If we were to do that, that is called debt snowball, use starting with a cash flow of 3530 bucks within the first month, August, September of 2023, we're kind of like in the middle. This person would take their cash flow, we'd immediately pay off that credit card, $2,700. We would have $830 left over that we could just either, either throw in savings or we can roll that into the next month towards the next thing that we want to hit, right? So I just showed of the 3,530, 2,700 pays off this credit card. We get the 250 gain because they're overpaying. They're making payments of 250 a month. It's actually only $58 a month is the required payment. But this is what they're actually paying. So therefore, that's the full cash flow recovery. And then I show the cash flow gain of 250. Right now, if we continue down this path and go to the next debt, which would be $800 and 17 cents. That's the payment plus 3,530, plus another 250, plus 150. Cash flow is always stronger together than when separated. I often see a lot of you, even prior to coming across the velocity banking concept, whatever cash flow you have left over, you're sending an extra $100 to this credit card, an extra $200 over here, an extra $100 on your mortgage, an extra $500 over here on this card, and then you're paying extra money on this card that's charging no interest. And so you're sending all your money into all different directions and they're all going to die slowly. Versus if you were to redirect all the cash flow, and here's what Dave Ramsey and I are in agreement with, right? So there's no disputing this. When you combine all the cash flow together and then make a lump sum payment, quote unquote, an extra payment to your one debt being the lowest debt debt, you're going to go faster than the person that is trying to pay everything off at the same time. Not going to work, right? You're going to go faster. Right? And that's been proven time and time again. Now, the other option over debt snowball, as it relates to making extra payments, there is debt avalanche and cash flow index formula. Debt avalanche is going to look at the highest interest rate debt. In that case, debt avalanche and debt snowball are saying to do the same thing, right? Because the highest interest rate would be the credit card. The next highest interest rate would be the car. The next highest interest rate would be the mortgage. So it's in the same order. Debt Snowball, Debt Avalanche are in the same order. Cash flow index, also in the same order. Velocity banking, also in the same order. Velocity banking always looking at cash flow first, interest savings second, balance third. Debt Avalanche is looking at interest first. Debt Snowball is looking at balance first. Cash flow index is looking at cash flow first. So all four of those strategies are actually telling you to do the same thing in this scenario here. Pay that credit card off, then pay the car off, then pay the home off. The only thing is when you're looking at the infinite banking concept or whatever marketing term you would like to use to keep it simple, we could say if you were to use a whole life insurance policy, a whole life insurance contract that is designed for high cash value, growth, short term and long term, instead of taking your extra cash flow each and every month and applying it toward debt, you would actually take that cash flow and you'd start funding a life insurance policy. So you're going to actually start saving money first into a cash value life insurance policy of which then at a certain point in time, you would borrow money out of that policy to then pay off these debts one by one. From a timeline perspective that is the slowest way to pay off debt so you might ask yourself well why would i do that does it make sense out of all the debt elimination strategies you're telling me that using a whole life insurance policy that would be the slowest way to get out of debt but it may not be the worst way to get out of debt even though it may take longer right and this requires a 
multi-dimensional way of looking at this, right? For you to comprehend that that may actually be more efficient in terms of when it's all said and done, when I'm completely debt free, what do I have to show for? And I think I have personally been witness to a lot of people in their late 50s and 60s that dedicated a lot, a big portion of their life eliminating debt, right? And during that time of becoming debt free, what happened? Taxes and inflation, cost of living, everything increased. The value of their dollar decreased. So although they gained cash flow along the way of becoming debt free, when it was all said and done, and now they're debt free, they're still somewhat paycheck to paycheck. They, they don't have the big gap between what they make and what they spend, despite being completely debt free and living below their means. It's like it's still extremely costly to, to live in the United States, right? Or in a particular state that they're that they're in. So they find themselves scratching their heads like, did I do something wrong? I thought paying off debt first was the, the best thing to do. And don't get me wrong here. I'm a big fan of eliminating debt. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of eliminating debt. But if that's all we do, stop there. And we don't think beyond how can we create more value on this planet how can we live more abundantly if we think small and just think about oh how can i just cover my cost of living and be protected and create my own little bubble hate to break it to you the outside economy the outside world is going to affect your own personal economy if you don't think which is the hardest type of work to do which is to think you don't think of ways to be productive and multiply your fruit to be a generous abundant giver and receiver you may find yourself 59 65 70 years old barely making it with your 401k social uh pension plan 401k social security right social security and maybe disability income, whatever it is, like it may not be enough. I'm, I still have yet to personally meet someone that is over the age of 59, retired, that does not have a business where they were able to successfully be financially free, right? Maybe they have slight financial independence, but they're one medical emergency, one surgery away from financial disaster. That's the honest truth. I've yet to meet that person that is over the age of 59, debt-free, receiving income distribution from, say, 401k, pension, social security, and that is enough to live the lifestyle they want to live. I haven't met that person yet, despite all the correct things they... So using a whole life insurance contract to that degree, understanding how to make your dollars more efficient, shift your mindset, create a paradigm. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to be looking at timeline I'm not going to go as deep as i thought i would i was already going deep with with this um, because i just wanted to give really good context here so i presented the timeline to say if you were to start with a whole life insurance contract first and not pay anything extra towards your debt you're absolutely going to go longer in terms of eliminating the debt now the beautiful part here is all of the money all of the cash flow that you would have sent to these debt institutions, you would have every single one of those dollars in an asset, which would be your whole life insurance contract. And you would have a death benefit to protect you on the way of getting out of debt. So although it takes longer, you would have more to show for than these two guys right here, right? Because if you did debt snowball, right? And this is being um, very generous, right? You or I should, no, I'm sorry. This is being very conservative. This could be faster, somewhat faster. If you were to just make extra payments and you can do the math, right? There's in the numbers. You can do the math, 3,530, then you pay it off. Then you increase the person cash by 250, right? Then you start on the car. The car will take you like 12 months, 12, 13 months to eliminate, right? Then you increase the cash flow again. Then you can start on the mortgage and you should get around this number if you be conservative right? It should take you about 4.5 years or less to, to pay off everything. Then the person would have over $5,530.17 in cash flow, and the client would be 59 years old. So right before they say, if they wanted to retire at 59, they could retire debt-free. That's not bad. You know, most of America is not living like that. So that's a win. To me, that's a win. But is it enough 
Not necessarily. Velocity banking says we can do it in three and a half years or less. And then this is the math to prove it. So I'll run through the math to prove that we can actually go faster than that snowball. So that's increasing efficiency by one year by saying, okay, if you absolutely want to get out of debt as quickly as possible, we can do it in three and a half years or less using a home equity line of credit, right? And I, in this example, I used a first position home equity line of credit. And I assume we, we get it in September of 2023, which is highly unlikely. What I, what I did was I kept the balance of the entire debt. So the reason why I say 3.5 years or less is because in reality, they can't even start with velocity banking. So I tried to do an apples to apples comparison where it's like with debt snowball, we can start right away, which is why with velocity banking, you can't start right away because you need to get the tool first. If you don't have the tool, it's going to take some time to get the tool. You got to do the research, you got to qualify, apply, get approved, close. Now you have the tool, then you get started. During that waiting period, if you went this route, you're going to do exactly what debt snowball does. So debt snowball says pay off the credit card. Velocity Bank, we're going to pay off the credit card. We're going to make extra payments. So whether we got the HELOC in October, November of, say, 2023 or even later in the year, what I did regardless, because I, I, I went super conservative, I put Velocity Banking in a worse position than that snowball on purpose to say, look, we're starting the strategy by owing $210,076 rather than minus $2,700 minus however many extra payments I would have made on the car. And even doing that, I still get this 3.5 years or less doing velocity banking. So now let's, let's look at the math, right? So this is assuming that we acquired a first position home equity line of credit at a 7% interest rate. And we got a intro rate of 7% for 12 months, right? There's quite a few HELOCs out there where you can get a intro rate of a lower amount, and then it jumps up to whatever the prime rate is, or might, might say prime plus or prime minus, or just prime, right? So starting off owing $210,076, we need to evaluate what our borrowing cost is. So 7% is the interest rate. We're going to times it by what we owe. This is how much money we would pay in a year if all I did was make interest only payments of $14,705.32 over 12 months. So 14,000 705 32 divided by 12. Their minimum required interest only payment would be 1,225.44. So what happened is we would have consolidated all three of these debts, moved it from 8.59, 3.75, and that 20 plus percent, and moved it over to 7%, right? And you might be thinking, Denzel, uh, does it make sense to move 3.75 to 7%? Does it make sense to do that? It only makes sense if we can bring our effective rate, right? This is a key word that we need to be aware of, the effective rate. The effective rate is the actual cost that you pay on a particular line of credit or, or loan. So if we were to do the math in terms of how much interest is remaining on this loan and you times it, uh, figured out the, the interest rate according to the balance owed, you're going to get a higher number than 3.75%, right? If you did 157, 73959 times it by 3.75, that's, that's not what you're going to pay in interest, right? That rate is being stretched out over a 22 year period. And what you have to understand is more interest is at the beginning of that loan than it is at the end. And what's cool about an amortized loan is that once you cut off the interest or eliminate it, it doesn't reappear. It doesn't show back up. So if I remove the entire loan, then I, I completely cut off any interest from being applied that was scheduled to be there with that payment versus in a home equity line of credit, as long as we owe money, no matter how much it is, we're getting charged at an interest rate, you then divide that by 365 to get your daily borrowing costs, get the daily borrowing cost, $40.28 on $210.76. That's how much you would pay per day for however many days you owe 210. That's how that works. Now, if we pay that off in one shot, then obviously I'm no longer paying interest. But the moment I take 
money out again, now that interest will reaccrue. Versus with scheduled, fixed, amortized loan, once you've canceled the interest, it's gone. It doesn't come back. So when you're making extra payments, that's how you actually pay it off faster because you're applying a payment to the principal, which cancels the interest that was scheduled over that 22 year period. And the faster, the faster you get ahead of that interest, the faster you pay off the home, right? Pretty, pretty simple. So this goes beyond looking at what this rate is and comparing it to what that rate is and that rate and whatever the rate is. We have to look at is the effective rate. What am I actually paying at the end of the day? And is that a lesser number than what was in here, right? So this is assuming one way of doing velocity banking. We don't have to do it this way. We could do it another way. We could use a second position home equity line of credit at potentially an even lower rate. And we could start small. We don't have to bite off the whole debt in one shot. And with a second position HELOC, we would just start with the credit card and the, and the car loan, right? And then work our way to the mortgage, right? And even then, right, if, if we did something like that, again, we would probably somewhere end up around here and might be even faster, which is why I say or less. Same over here, 4.5 years or less. This is assuming in those three, four and a half years, a person's income stays the same and their, and their cash flow. Everything stays the same, cost of living, which is obviously not going to be the case. Right? I am already conservatively assuming that I can be done in three and a half years, even if that snowball does it in four, right? Whatever factors contribute, it also contributes to velocity banking. So if I can do it in four years or less with that snowball, then velocity banking becomes three years or less, right? So I'm pretty sure you get that part. That's just showing the timeline. Let's let's prove the math. Let's show the math in terms of how much interest we will pay on a monthly basis over just 12 months. And once we see what the total amount of debt that gets removed starting at 210, then you would just take that number, divide it, and see how many uh, years you get. So we know that if I were to move all this debt, consolidate it into this one location, that is the most amount of interest I can pay in a year. We agree on that, and that's the most amount of interest I'll get paid in a day. So now, where velocity banking starts is all we did was consolidate, where velocity banking starts is instead of using just our net cash flow to pay off debt, we're using our entire income. 12,767 to pay that down. So I'm illustrating, this is how I overestimate to create room for error. So just know that whatever interest I display here is actually an overestimation. So even in my overestimation, I still came out ahead. So I'm overestimating. Here's how I overestimate. I'm assuming that this client will owe $210,076 for 10 whole days. They will then owe 197,309 for 10 days. And then they will owe $204,356.29 for 10 days. That is not what is going to happen. Why, Denzel? Well, when this client gets paid, they get a bi-weekly paycheck, right? So you would have to take the 12,767, you have to divide it into two and say, okay, well, they get paid every other Friday or whatever the case may be. So not all 12,000 is going into the line. But what's also happening is we're never actually going to ever owe $210,076 for not even more than 24 hours. Because the moment I activate this home equity line of credit, whatever income I had in my checking account is now going into this home equity line of credit. So it immediately reduces the balance. It immediately affects what I pay that day. I'm not going to pay $40.28. I'm going to pay $37.00. And 14 cents. That three dollars here, two dollars here, three dollars here, two dollars here, it's gonna create a massive difference. But even despite that, just to show you, going over estimation here. So I'm saying forty dollars and twenty-eight cents a day, I'm showing thirty-seven dollars and eighty-four cents a day, then I'm showing thirty-nine dollars and nineteen cents a day. I get the average of those three numbers times it uh, divide by three. So add the three numbers together, divide by three gives you the median range times it by 30 days, you should get this number. So in the first month of doing velocity banking, they will owe $1,083.11 at most on that home equity line of credit. That's how much they'll get charged. And that charge, depending on how this home, home equity line of credit functions, that charge won't get applied until the due date. What that means, and this is where people sometimes mess up their math on simple interest calculations when they run it through a calculator on a on a spreadsheet and sometimes their math gets a little messed up is they're assuming that I get charged say $40.28 on 
September 15th, 12 midnight, right? Once the day is over, then I wake up the next morning. I have 210076 on September 15th. And then on the 16th, I now owe $210,076 plus the $40.28. So if you're running your calculation like that, compared to my numbers, you're gonna get a higher interest cost than how I ran the numbers. It's very, very important. You don't mess that up depending on whatever calculators you're using, right? So you don't wanna make that mistake because that $40.28 is not getting charged to the person's first lien HELOC account at the end of every day. It's not how that works. That interest is accruing day by day, day by day. And then on the due date, it'll declare how much interest you now have to pay, which means that this this changes the math. Understand, this changes the math. $40.28, if it got charged on September 15th, that would mean on September 16th, I'm now paying that 7% rate on that interest. So that is going to compound itself day after day after day after day after day leading up to the due date, which would make it a much higher interest cost. And sometimes the, the calculators don't know that that's what's happening, right? So it'll assume the interest being charged, say, every single day. I think some calculators may do that. Some may may not. I'm not the best at running calculations through like different software. So when I do it on the whiteboard by, by paper, I'm actually going like day by day. And I'm saying this would be the accrued interest over a statement cycle that will get charged to your account on the due date. And guess what? The charge comes from the equity, from the available equity in the line. It doesn't actually come from my expenses. So it doesn't affect my expense number. My expense number doesn't go up now because now I have this interest payment to worry about. Well, Denzel, where did the interest come from? Well, the interest came from here. This is what, you know, on 250, on 800, and on 2054, if you added up the interest, what you're paying just on these two debts, you would get a higher number than 108311. So what happens is I'm now canceling the interest that I was going to pay over here while I was snowballing that, making extra payments, and I transferred it over here, and now I have the ability to manipulate that rate. I can change the what effective rate lower than 7% to bring it to a net interest cost in the first month less than what we'd be paying over here, despite this rate being a higher rate than that rate. That makes a big difference, right? So you have to make sure you're running the math right. That's super important that we just iron on that really, really good. Again, how do we come up with the rate? Whatever the balance is, you times it by the interest rate, you need to get that big number. That's your yearly cost divided by 365. That's your daily cost based on how many days you owe this number. And I did it by 10 days, 10 days, and 10 days. So what I did was, okay, at the end of the month, I owe 204.35629 and then add that number. Going into the next month, I do velocity banking again, and I'm still overestimating month to month to month. Another thing that we can do here that we don't do in Debt Snowball is we can also implement a credit card or two into the equation. So over here on the right hand side, I'm showing us paying $6,000 a month in bills from this number, 6,000 are bills that can be paid with a credit card and we're gonna earn about 1.5% cashback rewards. This is really cool. So I'm gonna get $90 back each and every month. That reduces my costs. That $90 is 90 more dollars that stood in the first lien HELOC each and every month. And even then, I'm not even showing here what that effect would do. All I'm doing is minusing $90 at the end of each month off the, off the interest. That's all I'm doing, right? And that's not even a, a fair, accurate reading on how it would actually affect the numbers. So $90 in cashback rewards. Then we got another credit card that we could use 0% for 12 months and 0% balance transfer fee. So we could leverage a 0% credit card that has 0% balance transfer fees for 12 months and move out of here, just like we moved out of there. We move 10,000 off of this balance, stick it in the card and just pay hundred dollars a month, which is going to be 1% of the balance principal because that's zero interest for the next 12 months. Could we do the whole credit card? Sure. Should we? I wouldn't, right? 
I always like to leave space in all of my tools, right? Always like to leave a healthy amount of space. So 10,000 is my high leverage number. That's, you know, two thirds, really 9,900. I just kind of round up 10K. So that'll increase my expense costs by what? $100. $100 has to, you know, come out of line of credit. And I'm assuming that I'm going to have an expense cost of 7,000 49.29 from 9,237. How did we get to this number, Denzel? Well, we're no longer paying that. We're no longer paying that. We're no longer paying that. Technically, the number should be this 5,980224. Denzel, why is that? Well, once we pay off the mortgage, there's no longer an escrow account. So that escrow money is now going to sit in the home equity line of credit for a period of time until taxes are do on the property. And then I would just pay them one shot. Well, if I have all that money sitting in the HELOC, is it not reducing what I owe? Even though I'm going to pull that money out later in the year, it's reducing what I owe. Would that change my effective rate? The answer is yes. If you said yes, the answer is yes. It's going to change the effective rate. But guess what? I didn't even include that. I'm going off this number, $7,047.29. And then in the second month, my expense number is going to be 7147.29 because we have $100 going to that credit card that we leveraged at 0%. We took 10K off of it. So 204, right? Plus the interest, minus 10K, minus income, balance goes down to 182. Add expenses, 189. Notice how this, the very next month, your interest cost of borrowing is going to reduce. It's going to reduce. It's going to keep reducing, right? So this is 12 months. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12. In 12 months, overestimated, we go from owing 210 down to 142, 387, 32, plus the interest costs. Then in that 12th month, you got to pay the credit card off, right? Don't want to give charge unnecessary interest. That was just a slight temporary leverage move. We could, we could literally do that again every year. And that will speed up your timeline in terms of getting out of debt, which is why I said 3.5 years or less. But I'm just showing one year of doing that. Add the 88 back, 100 a month times 12, it's 1200, 1200 minus 10, 88. 88 gets added to the line. So it'll, it'll increase what I owe. And then if we did it again, minus 10 the following year. So now the balance is going to be 142 plus the eight, right? It's like 151 something, right? If you added these interest numbers in parentheses, add, add all those up, you should get 10,558.68. That's an effective cost in one year. That's an effective rate of 5%. So we went from seven to five in one year. Each year, the next year, I'm not going to pay 5% again. I'm going to pay less. So the next year, if I, in the first year, went from, an, uh, went from an interest rate of seven and it was at a fixed rate and went down to five as my effective rate, in year two, let's say the interest rate goes up and it goes up by a point, goes to 8% in year two, my effective rate would would not increase or it would it would stay the same. It would potentially stay the same because I now owe much less money. So the volume of interest is gonna be less, right? Because each and every year it gets less and less and less. And if I'm still you know using credit cards and leveraging credit cards, then I'm doing even better. My effective rate is either gonna stay at 5% or it's gonna go down to like four and a half, maybe four. And it's going to keep going down, which is going to make you go so much faster. So in one year, we went from 210 down to like the 150-ish number. If you take that difference and just divide it by what's by what remains, you should get three and a half years. Again, this is being, I, I put Velocity Banking in a, in a worse off position and I still came out ahead because when I actually start velocity banking, I'm not going to owe 210076. Let's say, you know, we're in September of 2023. Let's say we didn't start velocity banking till December. So during those months, I'm, I'm going at the same speed as Debt Snowball. So I would, I would no longer have 210076. I would no longer have the 2700. And maybe that goes down 35. So we got, let me do this. At 207, 376, and we got, I'll just use October, November, and December. 3530 plus the 250 I, I got, and then the 150 I'm redirecting, so no longer making extra payments towards the house. So I'm at 3930, October, November, and December. 
times three, 11,790, right? Not even gonna include the, the interest that I reduced from that 800 payment. So I'm just gonna take that 11,790, call it 11,8 minus from the car balance at 37,836. The balance goes down to 37,836. It's say December, it's gonna be way less than that. It's probably like 36-ish or something that to that nature. So I would do 2076 minus the 11.8. Here's where I'm actually probably going to be starting velocity banking at 195 owed. So once I actually start, then all of these numbers will look even better. My effective rate will be even lower. Does that make sense? Right? So this was a super conservative way of illustrating velocity banking. But now you have to ask yourself, does that make sense? Should I do that? Like I'm, I'm, not trying to be biased towards one of these options. I want you to make the decision you feel is best for you. If you feel like Denzel, I just, I'm having a very hard time comprehending this. Start here, start here, start paying off your debt. That's it's totally logical. You're gonna recover, if you have no idea how to invest money, if you wanna avoid scams on the internet, if you wanna avoid getting duped, right? Getting, getting tricked, getting, sold in some some high ticket offer right and get fed ridiculous goofy claims on how much of a rate of return you can get on crypto or on this or on that or forex trading options trading and all this stuff which i'm sure you can make money in all those things i'm sure you can you don't have the comprehension skills you haven't thought about it you haven't studied it yet you could be going very 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 fast in the wrong direction so we can make complete logical sense that we can recover interest and cash flow guaranteed by simply paying down our debt. So we just start, if that's you, just start there. Four and a half years or less, you're 59 years old, completely done, you're cash flowing over $5,500. Most of America cannot even say that. So let's give you a high five just by doing that alone. And maybe somewhere along the process, maybe 12 months into that journey, you pay off the car, you pay off the credit card and you're left with the mortgage and you say, hmm, this mortgage is at 3.75%. That's a fixed cost, fixed rate. Can I learn how to earn more than my cost of borrowing on this mortgage loan? Can I do that? Maybe not. If speed is your thing, because you just have a desire to eliminate the debt and just be done with it. You're like, I don't care about efficiency and offsetting. And you know, I don't, I, don't, I, I just, I'm not even able to think that deep yet but I can make sense of going from 4.5 years to three and a half. If you can show me how to go a year, year and a half, almost two years faster, that's meaningful to me. I can then take that time to become capable to step into some efficient cash flow planning, call it. And then you might say, okay, three and a half years. I got this, right? I can totally do this. Wipe out everything in three and a half years. I'm 57, 58 years old. And then, then I take the next couple of years to start feeding a cash value life insurance policy, et cetera, et cetera, doing other things, making investments, getting into real estate. Okay, great. Okay, great. Or you might see a bigger picture here. You might say, you know what? I'm totally fine with paying the interest on all of these debts because I have a skill, gift, or talent in an area that I could potentially generate a 50, 100, double, triple rate of return than my cost of borrowing on these three debts. And you might say to yourself, with the net cash flow I have, if I put it into this vehicle where I can express my skills, gifts, and talents and earn a 100, 200, 300% rate of return in this business and generate enough cash flow to write a check in three and a half years or four and a half years or less, same amount of time it would have taken me to become debt free. I would have directed my cash flow towards building a money making machine according to my skills, gifts, and talents, according to my purpose to be to produce abundance, change my mindset, change my paradigm. And now I have 4x the income. Maybe I 10x my income in the same four and a half years it would have took me to get out of debt based on that level income I was at. So if you see that bigger picture now, you might be saying to yourself, well, maybe I'll go the IBC route and say, let me at least cover, protect my human life value by acquiring a life insurance policy that builds cash value, guaranteed, tax-free, and it's liquid. So I can reroute my savings into that account. So now I'm earning a higher rate of return on just, on just savings dollars. Maybe we don't even take all the cash flow, the 3,530, right? Maybe we just take a portion of the cash flow or a big portion of it, 
Say, this is going into saving. This is gonna build my account up and it's also giving me enough death benefit that if anything happens to me on my wealth building journey, on my journey to 10X, right? It's, it's easier to 10X than to 2X. If you step into that paradigm, that, that mindset shift, okay, cool. Then we should at least cover your human life value. If anything happens, a death benefit, tax-free death benefit gets paid out, pays off all your debts, and there's money left over to your heirs so that they can continue to live the same lifestyle that you were providing them because you were the breadwinner. So these are three different options. <clears throat> that snowball, velocity banking, IBC, or there's a fourth option. Can we do all three? Can we do all three? And this is what this is the area that I think I've been dwelling in the last five years is the is the combination method of all these different things. Because depending on who you talk to, they're presenting their philosophies to you that are either going to make sense and they're going to resonate with you or they're not going to make any sense at all. You're going to feel less smart and you're going to feel dumb and you're just going to like, I, I don't know, I can't listen to this guy or girl. It's just I'm, I'm confused. Whereas when you work with me, right, for those who that I've been coaching and working with for years, you can attest to this into the comments if you're an existing client. I initially met you wherever you were at and I slowly added principles and let you roll with those principles and we build and we build and we build and we build and build. So let me give you an example. This case study right here, what does using all three methods look like, right? What does that look like? Using debt snowball, velocity banking, and infinite banking all together. So now I'm going to erase this. If you're enjoying this, you're getting a ton of value from this session. Hit the like button. Subscribe. Let's have fun together. Let's learn together. Let's grow together. Let's build the kingdom together. Yes, you're enjoying it. If you're like, dude, this is a long video. I know. This isn't a Mickey Mouse TikTok, you know, get you all hyped up with leaving you with more questions than answers. All right. This ain't one of them things. This is a master class. This is a this is something you sit down with wife after dinner, for dinner, right? Before you go to work after work. This is something you sit down and you get your notebook, your pen, your coffee, and you're glued, you're zoned in, you're switching those numbers for your numbers, you're switching the debts for your debts, you're you're laying it out exactly how I did it for this client, but it's your numbers and you're laying it out and you're running the math and you're running the numbers, right? I'm giving you the the components of how I put all this together so I can see it. The, the, the more visual it is to me, the more real it becomes. I, I can see this happening for the client in each direction that they go. So let's incorporate all three methods and let's see how, how does that turn out. So if I'm to include all three methods, starting with Snowball, right? I'm going to assume, um, let's say you are someone that just, you just don't get IBC or velocity banking. You just like, you're like, Dude, I just, it's hard. I need time to comprehend that. Great. We're going to start with Snowball. It is my bet that within 6 to 12 months or less, I can teach you Velocity Banking. In the meantime, in those 6 to 12 months, we're doing Debt Snowball. And in those 6 to 12 months, we can pay off the car and the credit card. So I get 250 I get 800 I redirect the 150 to paying the car off rather than paying the mortgage down. And I have my existing cash flow of 3530 So that's first 12 months. Also, within those first six to 12 months, we're going to protect your human life value. <clears throat> Acquiring a WLI, whole life insurance contract, comes with the death benefit. We're going to improve your savings. So notice, they, they we didn't even talk about the savings, right? You throw savings towards debt, obviously that increases all the timelines tremendously, right? But is that the best use of cash? What if something happens, emergency, et cetera, et cetera? We can take their savings and let's say we design a strategy where we give ourselves the ability to pay in 15000 a year or something to that nature, but we only lock in a, a base cost of maybe somewhere around two to three K. So my cash flow reduces slightly, but I won't see the effect in the first year because I already have savings in place. So I have, if I did, if I went with 15 K, I basically have two years worth of funding towards this whole life insurance contract. I'm protecting my human life value. I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, this person doesn't have life insurance. So we can protect our lives with life insurance in our journey of becoming debt free and creating financial independence and financial freedom. So now that's this method and this method so far coming together. So we're simply using a whole life insurance contract to 
protect our human life value and save money more efficiently. This money that was earning an interest rate is going to get taxed. This money that's earning an interest rate is not going to get taxed. And it's growing at a higher rate of return than any CD, money market account, checking, savings, and even bond, right? Over a long period of time. <clears throat> not bad, not bad. So we got that going for us within the first six to 12 months. And we have the first two years or more pre-funded, pre-funded. And I have all this cash flow that I'm rocking with at the end of 12 months. Credit card, car is done. Also, within the first six to 12 months, I educate the client on how to do research on banks, how to qualify banks, how to find the right debt tool, say a first position HELOC or a second position home equity line of credit. It would be the two options that would be ideal for this, this client. If $750,000 of value in their home and they only owe 157, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of value in there that we could tap into and, and use to our advantage to create more income. Where Velocity Banking comes in is, let's say within those six to 12 months, I'm teaching them, I'm educating them, they acquire the tool. Once we have the tool, all we have left is the mortgage. Well, at that point, we might say, hmm, instead of using Velocity Banking to pay off that low rate mortgage, we could use Velocity Banking to max fund their whole life insurance contract, depending on how much space we created for the whole life insurance contract in the first place. If we only created $15,000 of space, then there's you know not much point to borrow because we're already cash flowing quite cash flowing very very well but now just having that tool at our disposal having that capital we might say well let's look at your skills gifts talents that lead to your purpose and we come up with a business plan come up with a business plan to learn how to 10x and discover why 10x is easier than 2x and go from making twelve thousand seven hundred sixty seven dollars and just move the comma over and add a zero now i'm making one hundred twenty seven thousand dollars a month and let's say you fail miserably and you only double your income are you upset in four and a half years or less you double your income most americans don't even ever do that in a lifetime they don't double their income so an incredible way of potentially incorporating all three and coming out with more than just doing one thing and it's a layered thing you layer it. Okay, I got in the rhythm of paying off my car and paying off my credit card. We got some early wins. We got some cash flow recovered. Wonderful. Great job, client. Great job. You're doing great. Then we got a policy in place. We're funding it. We're just saving money. We're not even touching it. We're just saving. Just saving money. Cool. Then we're educating ourselves. We're learning, right? We're reading books. We're learning why 10x is easier than 2x. We're learning about how to be, you know, provide great customer service, right? Unreasonable hospitality. Then we learn about permission to spend and we keep going. Then we learn about business secrets from the Bible, right? And we keep going, Mer learn mentorship. Then we learn about the and asset and we keep going. Just keep going, keep going. Now we're accumulating knowledge and information, and education. We're honing in on our skills, gifts and talents leading into our purpose. We've got whole life insurance as our base foundation, our protection, protecting our human life value in case anything happens to us in the process. We're accelerating debt. We're doing debt snowball. We're accelerating debt. Velocity Bank is our backup. We have a tool. We have a capital. We have available equity in our home. It's just there. It's just sitting there. It's waiting to be deployed into one of your skills, gifts, and talents. Maybe it's real estate. Maybe it's life insurance. Maybe it's starting a YouTube channel. Whatever it is, you now have this self-finance capital tool that you can use. You got two of them, really. You got the whole life insurance contract, but you also have your Velocity Banking debt tool that you can use to give you the capital that you need. And because you were learning about velocity banking, you learned about primarily how to offset interest costs. And that's huge. You learn how to offset interest costs. You're now unlike a majority of borrowers, right? Because when you borrow, you borrow at offset costs, zero costs. Didn't cost me anything. Whatever I paid, I offset by the gain. That is a different way of borrowing. If you learn how to borrow like that in a debt-based economy, we live in a debt-based economy. So Velocity Banking helps you understand how to use banking products to create offset to produce a gain. Whole Life Insurance shows you how to build your own self-financing tool that you get to set the rate, not necessarily the rate. You get to set the effective rate costs of what you borrow. You get to set the terms in terms of how you pay yourself back. And you get to set the terms in terms of how long you want to fund it, how much you want to save over that period of time. And we get to build and build and build and build and build. I'm not telling you what to do. My goal was to just share the options, share the options, the opportunities, 
what's available in front of you. This was a very, very, very in-depth class here. I hope you enjoyed it. You can click the links below to get a hold of me or reach out to any of my business partners that can help you put these different pieces together and I can serve you as well. And I really wish the best for you. Honestly, sincerely wish the best for you. God bless you. My name is Denzel Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. We do case studies just like this all day long on the YouTube channel. You can go back years and then look at the latest case studies and see how where the consistencies are, where things tweak, and then find the principles. Start applying those principles in your life. I look forward to talking again soon. Have a wonderful day.